morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, welcome to Depo, uh, another one of these amazing roundtables. Um, I'm Hilary, Hilary Orange. I'm talking to you from uh, sunny Wales, south coast of Wales, a, a few metres from the beach. And um, I'm at Swansea, History, uh, Swansea University in the History Department, and I'm organising this roundtable with Andy Clark. I don't know if Andy, if you just want to quickly say hello. So Hello, Hello uh, Andy Clark. I'm a research associate based at Newcastle University, logging on from a surprisingly very sunny Glasgow. Yeah, it's sunny here in the UK, so I hope it's where you are too. Now, I'm sounding a bit like a travel agent, so I'll stop at that point. Um, so we have a, a series of uh, speakers lined up to talk to you. I'm just going to share a PowerPoint at this point, so you're not just looking at my face. What we're talking about today is nostalgia in relation to deindustrialization and nostalgia particularly a reassessment in the era of austerity now we were just talking um a few minutes before um we started the session about whether the era of austerity applies um outside of the uk well make your own minds about that but it certainly it does apply here in the united kingdom right now this is going to be the format Oops, there we go. Format for today's roundtable was going to be speakers given. Oh God, what's that? Speakers given um, eight minute presentations. And we're going to ask you to keep your questions until after everybody is presented. And um, as we've just seen, please mute your microphones unless you're the speaker or the chair. But you can use the chat box uh, for running comments and for questions. So please do do that because that will help us in terms of the Q and A. I'll just come back to the slide later. So the other thing we wanted to say is how we actually got here, why uh, myself and Andy ended up um, proposing and having this roundtable accepted. Well, it actually goes back to a Twitter conversation. So back in. When was it? Can anybody see the date? Was it June or July? June. June, <laughs> which is uh, you know, five or six months ago. So Ewan Gibbs, who's one of our speakers today, posted um, this tweet on Twitter, and we're actually going to role play ourselves, partly for comedic value. Um, so there's a series of tweets that, that um, that day, we're talking about the relationship between uh, austerity industrialization work labor if you have it and nostalgia so you and over to you to read out your tweet please okay well i quoted hillary clinton who made reference to the industrial era saying where they were from west virginia or tyneside their lives were so grim and disease prone and unhygienic but the nostalgia for those days i don't know and i suggested that Hillary Clinton can't understand why people mourn the loss of secure, well-paid jobs in response to the statement. Okay, and that was relating to an article in the Financial Times. Okay, and then, you in again. I went all to, on to say it's also ridiculous to treat the mining era as though it was one continuous period of terrible paying conditions. Miners secured major improvements in health and safety and wages, which is what people in Britain and the American coal fields tend to regret losing. So this, by this point, my interest was piqued, and I tweeted, I uh, 100% agree with you, Ewan. Um, the 60s and 70s represented relatively high wages, same with the steel industry. It was respected and skilled work, and the emphasis in heritage and media of the 19th century plays with romantic, demonic and heroic tropes that do little to express the sense of economic community and professional loss. And then Andy joined in the conversation. Yeah, then I, I threw in my, my two pence worth um, and kind of moved it away from the work to the workplace. Um, it was the same in the female dominated factories that I write about. I didn't give it a term, but outlined how they differentiated between the job which is boring and monotonous, and the workplace, a site of friendship, camaraderie, etc. The smoke knacks, the, the smoke stack nostalgia idea is an insult to working class experience. And I put in a, a recent book by Andy, just as a plug. 
Um, so, Andrew, if you want to say something about your new book. Yeah, the book um, talks about three factories where women um, took over the factory in opposition to factory closure, termed fighting deindustrialization. There is a paperback run, which is quite cheap, but please um, don't feel the need to buy it, but do recommend it to your libraries if you can. And then I said, well, this would be a good topic for a conference session. And ding, here we are. So nostalgia industry and the working class. Yep, and I agree, yep, it would. Something for an at the Industrial Paul event. We should talk about it post weekend, because I think this was on a Friday or Saturday. It was definitely at the weekend, and my Twitter was going away from work to focus on um, football, as it usually does on a Saturday. And then we got back together after that and, and put this together. Yeah, so that's how we got here. So, as I said, it all started on Twitter. But obviously, the, the wider context is um, particularly what's been happening in UK politics over the last 10, 12 years, um, cost of living crisis. And also, um, I'm going to go back to the first slide now and play a BBC um, video. Um, so the last few days, um, this was all over the British media about the demolition of um, one of the iconic structures from Redcar. So those days have gone for good. So what do we do with nostalgia within all of this and um, not just in the UK, but also internationally? Well, hopefully we're going to find out. Does nostalgia need to be reassessed? Um, so this was uh, our, basically our session brief. Um, so Kerry and Heath got urged us to move beyond folks for nostalgia and tales of victimization through closure. However, 20 years later, do we need to revisit this perspective? Across the deindustrializing world, areas formerly built up around industry continue to suffer from multiple deprivations, um, crime, poverty, poor environment, toxic legacies, addiction, unemployment, poor health, and more. So in this round table, we're here today to, to talk about um, our reassessment of nostalgic reflections and their meanings can contribute to our understandings of multiple experiences in deindustrialization's half-life across generations. And taken together, how uh, these insights we're going to be hearing from these leading experts today can reconnect us to the history of deindustrialization and, and the contemporary experience of those communities worst impacted. So that's the brief. And this is for running order. So as I said before, so we're going to take each speaker in turn. Um, we're going to save all questions uh, and comments for after. However, again, please do use the chat box because that will be informative and helpful to your chairs, um, myself and Andy. And speaking of Andy, so I'm going to stop sharing this now and I'm going to pass over to Andy, Andy Clark from Newcastle University my partner in crime in all of this and ask Andy to share his uh, PowerPoint and the first presentation. Thank you very much, Hilary. I will just share my screen and put my stopwatch on because the chair has warned us not to go over these eight minutes. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'm, I'm going to be slightly strict. I'm not going to be that strict. I've, I've um, warned myself because I can talk and talk and talk um, and keep going. So yeah, so this kind of contribution of mine is, is thinking about that challenge and dismissive nostalgia. Now, my perspective was, was revealed somewhat in, in the Twitter conversation that we, we showed earlier. My perspective is that just dismissing working class experiences, smoke that stack nostalgia is in some ways insulting to those people who reflect and narrate their experiences and what, they, what is their experiences. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to take on this um, challenge that Kerry and Heathcock put down in 2003 that we were to move beyond tales of victimisation and move away from the workplace to see industrial work, quote, for what it was, tough work that people did because it paid well and it was located in their communities. Now, I read this just before I began conducting interviews for my PhD project, which has now culminated in the book that Hilary so kindly plugged for me. And these were three factories dominated by women workers. And that, I think, is quite important here as well, because I 
believe that the idea of smoke stack nostalgia came out of that very masculine dominated um, deindustrialization literature that focused on places with smokestacks and um, mines, those kind of places. Whereas the female dominated factory, as Jackie Clark has shown in, in, in her work, had a different environment, a different feel to it. So these three factories, it was um, a Lee Jeans denim plant, a lovable bra underwear plant, and plastic plasters, light electronics, where workers militantly opposed closure in the early 1980s. So as I began doing the interviews, I wanted to get a real sense of what the factory was like, what were their memories of the industrial workplace, because these types of sites haven't been as widely recorded, either con contemporaneously or historically, as male-dominated industrial sites. So I asked really detailed questions about what they did, what the work was like, the production process, the labour process throughout each site, but also what it was like to work there. Now, that very simple question of how do you reflect on your time working in that specific factory, particularly because they fought such militant battles to save their work, was that in just an economic determinism or were they fighting for something beyond simply the wage packet alone? And all of the interviewees, I interviewed, I think, 28 workers in total, and every single one of them narrated the experience of the factory positively. It became such a dominant common theme through all the interviews that it was impossible for me analysing those narratives to simply look at this as being nostalgia. So these excerpts that I'm going to read out, apologies that I don't have audio clips, I've been having some issues with my external hard drive, but I can, I can read them out for you. These are only a small sample of the response that I had when asking the women workers, what do you remember of working in the factory? What was it like working there? Cathy, who worked in Lee Jeans, I just loved my wee crowd of friends. I loved going up, knowing I was going in, seeing the lassies, wonder what's on the agenda the day, you know? You know, we're like, like we're in wee kind of family. Josephine, who worked at Lovable, oh, I loved it. I loved it. We enjoyed it. Oh, I enjoyed it. I would say I enjoyed my time in the factory. I definitely would. And then Mamie, um, who worked in Plessy, and reflecting the factory, narrated that there's this bon homie among working class people where they work, you know? A lot of laughs, and that's what I feel you got. So 30 years after working in these factories, when asked to reflect on what they remember of the sites, these are the dominant narratives that are coming across. It's a sense of a place where people enjoyed going to. And Teresa, who worked at Lovable, said, oh, at the time, I loved it. I did. I loved it. I, the place was great. You know, the people you got to meet and the laughs you had were great. Aye, it was great. At the end of the day, it was a job. You know, you got the chance of a day off or a holiday, then you took it, but it was good. Now I'm talking about it, and this is when she went on to talk about the job that she did. Now I'm talking about it, it sounds so boring. And that was a critical point of departure for me, reading these transcripts after I'd done the interviews, that she clearly differentiates. No, it was a, it was a job, you know, a chance of a day off, of course you took it. It was just a job, it was a, it was a boring job. And when I went back to the transcripts, that's what I feel you got. Like interviewees clearly differentiated between the factories as a site of sociability and solidarity and the monotony of their industrial work. This is not uncritical smoke stack nostalgia. And that's I don't feel that we get that when we interview former industrial workers. Having seen you and Slades earlier, this I think is going to become a common theme throughout the day. So again, more of these excerpts say they working there just meant I could make money. Every weekend, I'll have money to go out, buy clothes and things like that. It wasn't a case that you wanted to do it. It was just, it was there. Trisha, it was a job. You got up, got up and went to your work. You got your wages at the end of the week. It was just a job, you know. You worked in the Lee Jeans factory, mate, in Lee Jeans. That was it. Josephine, it was really hard work. Couldn't have done it now, not in a million years. Really, really hard work. And Margaret, similarly, it was just sitting doing such a monotonous job. I didn't get job satisfaction. So these in the same interviews, in the same interview conversation where they'll talk about the factory as something really significant and positive in their memories of their working lives. But when we get down to the bones of what was your job like, what you actually did working on an assembly line, there's no nostalgia for that type of work here. So this isn't smokestack nostalgia. And I would propose that projects on deindustrialization that reuse existing oral history materials will probably find that similar um, 
narrative of what Anna Green refers to as the critically reflective individual who are able to differentiate between the job and the workplace. For the interviewees, working in Lee Jeans and Lovable and Plessy was tough work that they did because it paid well and it was located in their communities. However, dismissing that as nostalgia completely ignores the value that was extracted beyond the wage slip. No one that I interviewed, no one that I spoke to had a, a career plan that they were going to be sewing machinists or assembly line workers when they left school. It wasn't a case, it was a job that they wanted to do. There was no effective commitment to the employer or to the type of work that they did. It was a means to an end. But in that means, in that space of the factory floor, which Jackie talks about, the, the site of female um, working class um, solidarity, a site of sociability, it's that aspect that remains in the memories of the workers. Because most of these workers, when they left factories, went into what is commonly perceived, perceived as higher status jobs than factory work. Many went on to work for the National Health Service, became nurses, became um, domestics in, in the NHS, which most people would say is a, is a step up from working in a factory. But when we look at those reflections that they had in that space, this was the time in their life where they remember having that real sociability, that real solidarity. And the other important thing, and this goes back to what I said earlier, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, and I've got 20 seconds in which to say it. This is where I, I feel that the masculine domination of deindustrialization studies leads to a lack of understanding of the entire deindustrial and industrial experience. When Cowie and Heathcote wrote this in 2003, we have to move beyond the body count. No one had really started doing the work of assessing what that feminine body count looked like, how women reflected in that. Because what I've talked about today and what I've found in the interviews is not revelationary in the slightest. This was written about by the sociologists of the 70s, 80s and 90s, Anna Pollock, uh, Maria Glucksman, Bruce Cavendish. These historical books exist. So to dismiss this as smokestack nostalgia is not only historically quite ignorant, but I would also argue contemporaneously um, unfounded as well. And I shall stop there. Okay, Andy, thank you very much. Um, Superbly done and bang on time. So no need for the chair to interject to tell you to hurry up. Thank you very much. So again, any, any comments and questions specifically for Andy, please use the chat. We're going to move on with no further ado. And ask Fred to get ready to, um, Fred Burrell, to share the screen. And just to, I will put the full bios of our talkers in the chat. Um, but just to quickly introduce Fred. So Fred Burrell is a postdoctoral researcher at Cape Breton University, where I believe um, chat is going to be next year for its annual meeting. And Fred has just recently completed his PhD in history at Concordia University. So that's all I'm going to say. Hand over to Fred to get going and I'll put his biography in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hilary, uh, and thank you uh, to, to yourself and to, to Andy for in, inviting me to participate in the conversation. Um, I'm not uh, well prepared or professional enough to have slides, so you're just, you're just going to see my, uh, my big hairy face for, for the next eight minutes. Um, feel, feel, feel free to look elsewhere. Um, when I was originally asked to to participate uh, in in the panel, I, I I sort of thought to myself, well, you know what what leads to us still talking about uh, nostalgia, and um, because you know, of course, the 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 the, the work that the Cowie and Heathcote work that that Andy is referencing um, is now almost twenty years old. Um, and that that push to to move uh, beyond smokestack nostalgia or beyond the ruins um, seemed to me to be uh, fairly well accepted within within uh, the field of deindustrialization studies. You know that we've talked about uh, critical nostalgia, that we've talked about uh, reflexive nostalgia, that uh, you know we we've we've drawn on 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 the work of people like Alistair Bonnet to think about. Um, you know the the role of nostalgia and loss in the left. Um, so I wondered, you know, what what else is there to say uh, about nostalgia? But of course, you know, I'm uh, I'm very happy to to participate uh, in the conversation. So I thought I would try to find some things to say anyway, uh, because it, you know we're, we're learning from each other as we go. Um, so I want to just say 
kind of two share two stories about nostalgia that I've come across in my in my own work uh, and my own organizing, uh, and in the process perhaps make a, a small historiographical point. Um, so the first one, my work is uh, in a in a working class neighborhood uh, of Montreal called Saint Henri, uh, which is largely French speaking, uh, largely uh, Euro descended Quebecois uh, neighborhood, um, where I worked for a long time as a tenant organizer, uh, and where I did interviews with um, uh, largely women workers, sort of similarly to Andy, uh, although in many many different types of industries. Um, and their descendants and the kind of people who have lived in the half-life uh, of deindustrialization are now dealing with uh, gentrification and, and the forces of eviction in the city. Um, so one of the factories that, that some of my interviewees worked in was a, was a toy factory, an American-owned toy factory called Eagle Toys. Um, Eagle Toys was uh, notorious uh, for its poor working conditions, for environmental hazards, activists at the time, labor activists uh, who were seeking to organize the plant, um, referred to it as a concentration camp, referred to the conditions a, as being like slave labor. Uh, it was most of the women who worked there were um, 18 and under and, and with, with a small contingent of uh, uh, of migrant uh, men who also worked there. Um, people would repeatedly get uh, laid off and harassed uh, in order to, to not become unionized and, and permanent employees. Um, and the woman that I was interviewing was actually was her first job. So she had dropped out of high school in order to support her family. Uh, she was working there when she was 14 uh, in 1974 and making... Um, you know, basically what, what was that minimum wage, but was uh, a survival wage, very, just very basic uh, conditions. Um, and, you know, I was asking her about it. I'd kind of come in with this activist framing and um, she uh, was, uh, to my surprise, um, talked about how much she loved working there. Um, and, you know, as she said, it was it was so great. You know, we could... We could go, they would only keep us for three months, but you know, then we would go work somewhere else for a couple of weeks and then we would come back. And you know, I never got in the union, but it was okay. And as she said, des beaux souvenirs quand même. It's uh, the, 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 the lovely memories all the same. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I said, I was thinking to myself, what, how could it be that uh, labor conditions that activists were describing as a concentration camp uh, in the period were remembered uh, in this way. And it's not, of course, obviously, the point is not that uh, my interviewees' memories were wrong, um, but that in the interceding years, in the 30 years between when she had worked there and when uh, I interviewed her, she had been unemployed uh, for 20 of them um, after having been downsized for a series, uh, through a series of industrial jobs into permanent unemployment. Um, and those years have been very, very difficult. Um, and so she was expressing uh, loss of something through um, through this nostalgic, uh, this kind of nostalgic framing. She was she was expressing loss uh, of the life and dignity uh, that came through having uh, reliable employment. Um, and I think. What strikes me about this um, is that nostalgia is an, a, an affective strategy uh, that gets um, articulated by working class people uh, and people who are uh, on the variety of a bottom of, scale, of different scales of power um, because uh, there is a lack of collective context and struggle in order to transform it uh, into a critical um, appraisal of the past and a link with future struggle. Um, so nostalgia is something that that comes up in the absence uh, of collective struggle. So the 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 the, the moment of of activist um, kind of furor in the 1970s around organizing that workplace um, is so long ago and. The person who I was interviewing had been in a context of isolation and alienation uh, on, on welfare for so long uh, that all that was left was kind of the, oh, wasn't it better than 
as as compared to to now you know basically a sort of a a lamentation for a lost world rather than an ability to transform this uh into into critical perspective through collective struggle um and this brings me to my uh, historiographical point that i want to just make quickly it's it's really interesting i think that um Cowie and Heathcott, you know, urged us uh, in 2003 to, to go beyond the ruins, to leave behind smokestack nostalgia, while in fact locking us into a representational approach um, that really basically made it impossible to do so, um, so that the, the field of deindustrialization studies uh, in the interceding 20 years has largely been about sort of memory and culture um, and, and you know, the, those individual daily uh, lived experiences of loss and dispossession, um, rather than, um, you know, the field pushing uh, to, to reconnect to struggle, to reconnect to politics, uh, to, to help people connect the, the experiences of loss that they've had to a transformative uh, and liberatory political agenda. The second story um, that I want to tell about nostalgia is, is an interview um, that I did just a couple couple years ago now with a woman who uh, never actually worked, um, who, who grew up in the in the in the context of closure in which herself and everyone she knew um, lived on benefits um, and, and continues to do so and is, a, is, a, is critically engaged in neighborhood struggle is a is a is a person that I uh, have a lot of respect for, um, but when I talk to her about the neighborhood, you know, she part part of her resistance against gentrification is, you know, the way it has changed, the the, the fact that we have nowhere to kind of hang out anymore, like the little the little sort of uh, working class uh, bars and restaurants are closed. Um, you know the we the the grocery store is too expensive. I spent all I spent all my time like kind of collecting cans, right? Because I I have to be exchanging these in order to be able to pay for my groceries. Um, and the nostalgia that she expressed was uh, was was a source of resistance because you know the 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 change in the neighborhood is a force of uh, of displacement. Um, but it was also the nostalgia that she expressed also a form of. Um, of displacement and, and of exclusion uh, to others. Um, you know, in, in saint Henri is traditionally, as I said, uh, largely white, largely francophone. Um, and, and part of the part of the change of gentrification uh, is that there are more English speaking people in the neighborhood. Uh, and there are also more people of a variety of immigrant backgrounds. Um, and so she, you know, she was also, in, you know, while having this kind of political left analysis of the forces of gentrification was also lamenting the loss of a certain cultural homogeneity. Uh, so in the in this kind of, you know, in this moment of, of, of construction of self and collective resistance through an affective strategy of, uh, of nostalgia, um, was engaging in, in in a kind of a xenophobic uh, discourse about about the the new arrival in the neighborhood, and I wonder. I think this is probably something that is is, is particular to uh, the settler colony context, as distinct to some of the the the, the European context that that my fellow panelists will be discussing, um, because the the work uh, the work of nostalgia, the work of of the construction of the self through reference to the past in the context of, of settler colonialism is in fact uh, a process of um, writing oneself back into the past as the indigenous population, rather than as the colonizing population, which of course uh, white Francophones uh, are in, in Quebec. Um, and you know, this is this is this is something that um, is based on uh, a very a very modern kind of creation of what is the neighborhood of Saint Henri is something that was created by nationalist intellectuals in in 1960s and 70s that in the process wrote out the black population uh, and wrote out um, wrote out the indigenous population which of course here we are uh, in Montreal on uh, unceded Ganyanka or or Mohawk territory so this again raises to me the question uh, of, uh, of the purposes of nostalgia and how nostalgia gets expressed. Um, and then what is the purpose uh, of 
our work as scholars who study working class communities and who are engaged uh, in working class communities. Um, and I think that nostalgia, because it is this sort of individualized uh, affective strategy that, that articulates loss and that loss um, can be a basis for, uh, for mobilization and politics, uh, transformative politics, but it can also be a basis for uh, exclusion and, and for an articulation of an identity um, that, that seeks to grasp onto uh, a whiteness um, or, a, or a kind of a coherent identity that in fact was always based on the exclusion of others or the exploitation of others um, makes it such that our work as, as, as historians and, uh, and as scholars of deindustrialization has to be uh, one of struggle uh, and has to be one of engagement uh, and, and, and bringing the working class communities that, that we are amongst and with and from um, into, uh, into a collective articulation of that loss and rage rather than, um, rather than leaving it in, in the register of, uh, of personal experience and loss. So I don't know if that gets me up to my my eight minutes, but that's that's what all I have to say. Thanks very much. That's brilliant, Fred, and adequately done uh, without PowerPoint. So, um, applause to you. So, um, while we're thanking Fred for his uh, passionate presentation, if you don't mind saying, I thought that was very engaging. Uh, we move over uh, quickly to Jackie, Jackie Clark. And again, I'm going to give a very quick introduction. So Jackie Clark is Senior Lecturer in French Studies at the University of Glasgow, where she is also a member of the Centre for Gender History, and she's a co-I in the DEPO project, and I'll post the rest of the file in the chat for you all to read. So over to Jackie, with no further ado. Thanks, Hilary. Um... I'm, I'm not going to use a PowerPoint either. I, I, I think I did like one slide with some bullet points on it, but it's hardly worth our while. Um, um, so I'm just picking up on some of the things that have already been uh, said. When I started to think about how to um, approach this roundtable, I, 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 I suppose I thought there are sort of three different dimensions to the way in which this question of nostalgia has been posed in the context of um, deindustrialization studies and in a way we've already touched on those so there's a question of what's at stake when certain kinds of working class narratives or feelings are dismissed as nostalgic in public discourse um, there's a the question of how we can best conceptualize the effective investments in past working life that um, that we do see, and, and those of us who work with oral history in particular are, have, have been very aware of these. Um, and so if we're going to use the term nostalgia in that context, what are the limitations of the term and, 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 and how can we use it? And then um, uh, finally, several people have already alluded to this, this um, uh, Cowie and Heathcote sort of uh, warning that as historians we must avoid smokestack nostalgia. Um, so um, there's the question of to what extent do we as academics or as, as heritage professionals or, who are maybe also on the call, you know, to what extent do we engage in something that could be called smokestack, smokestack nostalgia? Um, and you know, if so, is it a problem and what are we going to do about it? So I guess there's different sort of dimensions to um, the question. So I've got some possibly slightly rambling thoughts about that, that will address, I suppose, at least some of those some of those things, possibly tangentially. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Um, so I guess I, I, I suppose my thoughts resonate a lot with some of the things that have already been said. I mean, I think the problem for me with nostalgia actually lies less in the affect itself than in the sort of uses and abuse of the term. Um, and it, in its everyday sense, as, as others have already pointed out, um, it's very much a sort of pathologizing uh, term and a polemical term. To designate a view as nostalgia or as, as, as nostalgic is to, is to take what's actually a political disagreement about what's valuable in the past and re-articulate it in temporal terms as a choice between looking back or moving forward, between sort of living in the past or moving with the times. Um, and it positions that nostalgic sentiment as a kind of denial. And that I think is to reframe 
conflicting views, politically conflicting views as points on a kind of linear temporal um, axis that's in effect to deny the politics of that sort of disagreement. Um, and so I think that the to, to sort of designate someone else's position as nostalgic um, does a kind of um, ideological work of kind of uh, 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 that, that sort of occludes the actual politics of the disagreement and puts your own position sort of beyond question. Um, so two things I think uh, flow from that. One is that um, when a position or a narrative is described as nostalgic, we should attend to the politics of that claim. And secondly, if we are going to continue to use this term in academic discourse, then how do we, you know, how do we use it and can we use it in, in ways that sort of take distance on that kind of polemical use of the term? And uh, um, as, as Fred um, uh, sort of nodded uh, uh, already in the direction of the sort of literature that's developed around reflective nostalgia and critical nostalgia, um, terms that come out of, I think you mentioned um, Alistair Bonnet, um, uh, Fred, there's work by Fred Davies, Yearning for Yesterday, a Sociology of Nostalgia, that goes back to 1979 that Tim Strangleman, I think, has used a lot, I don't know if Tim's on the call. Um, um, and more recently, Svetlana Boehm's The Future of Nostalgia is often cited in this context as well. So there's this body of work that uh, looks at ways in which um, nostalgia is often um, not simple, but rather kind of multi-layered and reflective and can be used in these kind of critical ways. Um, so, I mean, an example of critical nostalgia from my own work, um, uh, from, you know, I've done uh, work not just with women workers, but notably with women workers working for a, the French domestic appliance company, Moulinex. And um, they, one of the things that um, was, uh, was often sort of cited about um, the Boulinex workers was their kind of nostalgia they had for their, their boss, the founder of the company, Jean Montley. And this is often described as being in the press as being a kind of residual paternalism on the, on the part of the Moulinex worker. Um, but I think this overlooks the agency of the narrators and the kind of stories they tell about this former boss. Because actually, um, Oh, I found that when they spoke to me about um, the fact that they thought Mobley would turn in his grave at certain things that subsequent bosses had done, what they're actually articulating is a critique of um, the what happened once the ownership structure of the company changed and became much more financialized and a big push for shareholder value meant a series of restructuring plans uh, were introduced. Um, um, before enabling um, in investors to take sort of significant uh, profits just before the company um, sort of finally collapsed and these people found themselves um, out of a job. So um, I guess I'm striking a slightly uh, different note from you, Fred, in the sense that I think these stories were being told in a context where people were mobilized and um, they were involved in a struggle. And uh, this was part of the articulation of the values of that struggle, that they were kind of um, contrasting, I guess, their values rooted in a sense of the sort of social value of work with uh, what they saw as the bad types of bosses who were only concerned with money. Um, uh, so there's a very clear sort of critical nostalgia uh, there. Um, I noted in the conversation we had just before we um, uh, started the, 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 the session um, that a few of us were having that I was slightly puzzled by the framing of the um, of the session as being about a sort of reassessment from the point of view of the age of austerity, because I think that the idea of the age of austerity is much more meaningful in the British context than it is in the context that I work in, which is um, about France. Um, I think the age of austerity is very starkly marked in the British context because the period prior to the financial crash in 2008 um, was marked by a boom period and a period of a certain kind of cultural optimism. Um, and depending on one's point of view about Blairism, I suppose, but um, but um, the that is not the case in the French context. And so I would say that in France, the sort of broader kind of uh, cultural climate has been one where there's been a kind of protracted cultural and political crisis around the world of work for at least the last 20 years and there's not I, there's not to me a clear sort of moment of austerity that reframes that um, and I would recommend actually on this subject a book by a colleague in French studies uh, Jeremy Lane who's written a book called Republican Citizens Precarious Subjects 
um, that looks at how this sense of crisis is refracted, refracted through um, cultural texts. And Lane theorizes this as being about France's transition from Fordism to post-Fordism, um, which is a framing that connects up with a, another sort of wider body of work about post-Fordist affect. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has sort of consulted a work that is um, in that uh, area. It sort of speaks in some ways to the question of nostalgia, um, but it's a body of work that's much more rooted in cultural studies, cultural theory, anthropology. Um, and um, um, there's um, Lauren Berlant's work, there's Andrea Muelbach and it's in Shoshan's work on an issue of anthropology. Um, and some of us may have reservations about whether, you know, this kind of typology of Fordism and post Fordism works for the context in which we're, which we're talking about. Um, I found elements of it useful for thinking about um, France and particularly thinking about the kind of crisis around work and some of the kind of affects around that um, in contemporary France. France obviously did go through this big push to create an economy based on mass production and mass consumption. Um, in the post Second World War period, accompanied by the expansion of the welfare state. And this involved a cult of growth and a promise of security, um, an expectation that your children would be better off than you were, better educated, uh, better housed, better cared for in all sorts of ways. So socially and culturally, a particular kind of relationship to the future was created in that period, which you know may have been much more precarious than the myths of that uh, that kind of you know um, Fordist myth of sort of job security and so on would have us believe. But it nonetheless existed, I think, and I think that the kinds of effective investments that we often find in memories of the good times of industrial work are very much about the disintegration of that kind of collective optimism. Um, so in that work, I found that some of that work quite useful to get away from the idea of nostalgia and, and to ask a different sort of, a more open question about affect, about what kinds of affects are present here and what work do they do? Because I, I, I find the nostalgia term sort of closes things down a little bit. Um, and it allows me to think in a slightly different way about sort of affect and temporality as well, which I found helpful. So, um, so I think there's some interesting potential connections to be made with that field. Um, I'll, I'll maybe stop because I probably have to be quiet now. <laughs> Am I over time? No, that's absolutely great. Thanks, Jackie, really interesting point. So um, many thanks again, big applause for Jackie and Moving on to the next speaker, who is uh, Sinead. Uh, I don't know if you have slides. Sinead, I do, I do, yes. Share them and I'll very quickly just say a single sentence intro. So Sinead is a history PhD candidate at the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast. I'll put the rest of the bio in the chat. So over to you, Sinead. Everybody. Thank you. Um, can I just check that everybody can see this? Can everybody hear me and see me okay? See everything? Perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, firstly, to Andy and Hilary for inviting me to participate in today's round table. Um, so today I'll be kind of talking about nostalgia, but from more of like a radical and critical perspective, I suppose, kind of almost sort of falling into a lot of the definitions that we've been exploring here. Um, but I want to make specific reference to visual and textual representations of my own work and um, of my own research that um, looks at the Lower Falls area in West Belfast. Um, so really, what I wanted to do was kind of explore some of the, the questions and themes that popped up a little bit. Um, because what had happened was I primarily look at um, photography, but whenever it was coming to um, contextualize the photographers that I was looking at, um, I started kind of stumbling across all of these um, publications from community groups that similarly dealt with some of the issues that I felt were creeping up in some of the, the photographs. Um, 
So it was whenever I began to sort of contextualize the work and research area in more detail um, that I started looking at how nostalgia was being dealt with in different and sort of interesting ways. Um, so I'll talk you through a few of these um, sort of publications and community groups um, and sort of explore how, they, how these groups did engage with nostalgia to speak not only of the past, but also of the present. And it's that interesting sort of negotiation of the temporal plane that I find to be most interesting. Um, because nostalgia was used in that context to mobilize and empower communities and the histories and values and experiences of those communities as they grappled with the tremendous amount of change. And a lot of my research really focuses not only on the impact of deindustrialization, but that legacy. So what happened afterwards? And in the case of West Belfast, you have this huge decline of traditional industries like um, textiles. And immediately afterwards, you had the redevelopment of that area. So when you're speaking about loss, you find that it's not only just the loss of employment, but it's the loss of whole communities. It's the loss of houses, it's the loss of facilities. All of these things happening kind of on the street you know, pretty soon after, um, after the industrialization. So to give you a bit of an idea of where I'm talking about, um, my research focuses on the lower columns. So it's this area just in the purple circle. And immediately beside it, you have a huge amount of local industries. So that would have employed most of the lower columns area, and it was primarily really textile industries. Um, so again, kind of opening up this conversation about women's employment here as well, um, because Northern Ireland had a very interesting kind of industrial economy that was really divided along gender, class, and sectarian lines. So in places like the North Falls, you had a huge amount of this population that were really restricted in terms of the industries that they could work in. So it was mostly women who were employed by the local textile industries that you see here just on the edge of the purple, um, the purple line there. Um, so what you find is that the loss of industry kind of started to really decline between 1950 and sort of 1976. And um, Bill Rolston and Mike Tomlinson noted that up to 72% of um, women's employment fell during that period. So the loss of industry then, particularly female, um, labour in terms of industries, uh, was then preceded by major redevelopment of this area um, just within the purple uh, oval there. And what had happened was that they redeveloped the area and replaced it with a multi story uh, flat complex called the Divis Flats. And it quickly gained a really notorious reputation for violence, for antisocial behaviour, and for poverty. So by the 1980s then, community projects started to emerge that used nostalgia to speak of the past in a way that they were then able to also critique the present. And they were able then to mobilize their community histories, values and experiences. Okay. So one of the first, one of the first examples that I'm going to talk a little bit about um, is the photography of Mark Angle. So he was the original photographer that I was looking at that kind of started me in my quest. Um, starting me on my journey. Um, and what Mark Langle really did was use documentary photography to engage with this, this sort of radical nostalgia to capture this uneasy transition between the old working class communities of the lower ponds, was known as the Pine Lily, and the new post-industrial community of the Divis Estate. So this photograph, taken in 1982, speaks of that conflict between traditional symbols of the old community through the terrace street through the force of art. Um, and it contrasts that with the encroachment of the multi-story estate that we can just see in the left here in the corner. So Nango really visualizes that temporal and spatial transformation of the area through that juxtaposition of symbolic elements of the past with those of the present. And as these elements come into conversation, the photograph asks the viewer to really start to critically assess the long-term and material legacies of the industrialization and urban um, transformation. So it provides almost like a visualization of that sort of um, negotiation of the temporal plane, that sort of temporal shift. But at the same time, you also have community groups such as the Divis Community Arts Project, 
that emerged at the time. And they really sought to try and bring attention to the terrible conditions within Dibbs Black Complex. And they similarly use a kind of a, a connection with the past with the present. And they similarly reflected that, um, you know, they provided an in, uh, that sort of damning insight into the social conditions that were faced by many and called upon, similarly called upon symbols of the past, such as the Ragman, to empower and protect the histories, memories, and culture of that area in the face of increased sort of stigmatization. Um, so as you can see in the, in the quote here, he directly, they directly juxtapose elements of the past like the Ragman with the kind of decline of that old community culture and value system. And then moving on into sort of 1985, you have a community that Divis sort of community uh, residence organizations, um, such as the Divis Residence Association, which called for the state's demolition in the face of the kind of increased social um, kind of what well, the social issues that the estate continued to face. And they published this uh, publication called The Dreadful Enclosure. And yet again, we see that kind of conversation between the past and present, and that dialogue that's opening up, that critical dialogue that's attempting to sort of engage with the politics of the present by really drawing attention to sentimental and effective memories of the past. And then finally, I'm conscious of time, don't run over, don't want to run over. So finally, what we also have as well is community arts organizations such as Belfast Exposed, which was a community photography organization. And they similarly engaged with critical conversations between the past and present. And in 1987, they released Falls in Focus, which was a kind of visual history of West Belfast and the Falls Road in particular. Um, and this publication was really designed to empower the history of the area and resist stigmatizing representations that were prevalent, particularly in the media. And this booklet contained this double page spread here that you can see that placed the past in direct conversation with the future, or with the present, sorry, through visual juxtaposition. On the left, we have um, a photograph of Reeves Black Spinning Mill, which was located at the corner of Conway Street and Falls Road. The mill itself closed in 1960, 61, and was repurposed as a car showroom before it was badly damaged during sectarian rioting in 1969. But um, the interesting point here is that after the car showroom was badly damaged, the whole building was demolished and replaced by a social security office. Um, so here you have the juxtaposition that is the ironic critique of the economic impact of industrial closures on communities such as the Lower Falls. And it's in this way, I really think that we need to consider not nostalgia, not just as a kind of sentimental or um, sort of effective longing for the past, but instead use it to link the past with the present and provide a vehicle that's capable of harnessing the emotion and memories of the past to critique processes of deindustrialization and redevelopment, empower communities and protect their histories, values and experiences. And it's that that we think is becoming by a kind of obvious thread in our presentation so far is that focus on the effect of experiences, not just of individuals, but of groups as well. And the interesting thing that I found in my research was that there was a tremendous amount of community groups that emerged within this period to do just that. And they were really focused as a group on sort of protecting those histories and almost reclaiming them again from the sort of historical narrative that had started to really phase them out. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry yeah. if it was a bit chaotic. <laughs> no, thank you, Sinead. That's great. Um, big round of applause for Sinead. So um, right, okay, we're, we're moving on to the last three now. So the next person to talk is Professor Stephen Berger, who we all, we all know, um, Professor of Social History, and Director of the Institute for Social Movements at the Royal University in Bochum in Germany. And, um, and Stefan, I don't know if you have a PowerPoint or not, or if you're just going to do a Fred and talk or a Jackie and talk. 
<laughs> Thanks very much, Hilary. Um, no, I'm just going to talk uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, what I'm going to say really is based on an article that's uh, only available in German, which I thought it might be uh, good to um, um, say a little bit about it in English. It came out with Zeithistorische Forschung, which is a journal of contemporary history um, in uh, last year in 2021. Um, and it really starts with the um, observation that often um, the, the memories of an industrial past, uh, not the least through forms of industrial heritage, um, are given a new value. Um, and that this kind of valorizing of the memories of an industrial past uh, serves not the interests of those who have formerly worked in those industries, but it usually serves a tourism industry. Uh, we can see this very clearly in uh, places like China, uh, which have gone massively into the heritageization of uh, industries now defunct, particularly in the northeast of China. Um, and uh, the end result of the memorialization is uh, really a uh, way of uh, commodification and uh, commercialization uh, of those memories that work heavily with doses of nostalgia. Um, so nostalgia serves the interests of a tourism industry. I think uh, Luc Boltanski and Arnaud Esquerre, if you pronounce his name like that, uh, two French sociologists have uh, written uh, on this extensively. Um, but I think that there is also obviously a different way of looking at nostalgia. On the one hand, it is undoubtedly true. Uh, it can carry uh, all the kind of rose-tinted spectacles um, views. And I think Fred already expressed skepticism in terms of nostalgia often preventing uh, activism and working as a break on, on activism. And uh, Jackie also uh, very... Um, um, convincingly talked about the um, sort of semantic limits of using concepts of nostalgia. Um, you know, I would add that often this kind of nostalgia uh, can be a form of what Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, described as antiquarianism uh, in his uses and abuses of history. Um, so a form of memory that has no link to the present, that is rooted in a dead past. Um, and uh, on the other hand, though, I would say that it can also, uh, nostalgia can also relate to versions of uh, what uh, Hayden White has called the practical past, i.e. a past which forges uh, links between the past and the present and the future. In other words, nostalgia can also serve the purposes of rediscovering uh, what Reinhard Koselik called past futures. Uh, so uh, what in the past people imagine to be a future uh, which have has often been forgotten in the present uh, and nostalgia is one way of recovering those past futures in the present in order to build uh, a future um, on the basis of what Svetlana Boim called reflective nostalgia. And this kind of reflective nostalgia would then be a way um, of empowering also activism, of empowering social movements to work in the present uh, for uh, a future. I think um, Alistair Bonnet has shown that in relation to a variety of historical social movements, how in a way their radicalism used nostalgia for what he calls the politics of nostalgia. Uh, in that sense, I think nostalgia can also be part and parcel of what Raymond Williams called structure of feeling, uh, i.e. the kind of everyday emotions and values that are associated uh, with practices um, like work, but also practices that are rooted in the neighborhood. Uh, so nostalgia in that sense, I think, is part and parcel of uh, a memory that is trying to intervene in the present. Uh, in that sense, it is uh, related, I would argue, to um, forms of agonistic memory, what uh, Hans Lauge Hansen and uh, Anna Cento Bull call agonistic memory. Uh, and we have to remember that, in a way, the normative dimension of agonistic memory is a form of mem memory that positions itself very firmly 
uh, on the side of those who are seeking for greater social justice and who are seeking to um, um, empower the values of solidarity in society. And I think this chimes well with uh, what Laura Jane Smith and Gary Campbell have written about nostalgia uh, and uh, working class memory, but also with the older work of Tim Strangleman, who looked at um, nostalgia for good life and for kind of work practices uh, in the British railway industry. So um, in that sense, I think nostalgia can be part and parcel of a non-binary, a multi-perspectival way of remembering industrial pasts, where those pasts are not closed off um, uh, in, in the past, but where they remain meaningful for the present and future of those um, often re-industrialized and only rarely really truly post-industrial uh, societies of the present. I would also argue that this form of nostalgic memory uh, is often multi-directional in Michael Rothberg's uh, sense. Um, Michael Rothberg, the memory scholar uh, who has written on multi-directional memory as an intersecting form uh, of memory which connects different forms of or different realms uh, of memories. Um, and uh, in a later book, of course, um, his, his, his latest book, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on the implicated subject, uh, Michael Rothberg has um, uh, gone one step further, I would argue, in saying that um, forms of memory uh, are often uh, forms that um, reveal overlapping power structures. structures. And if we uh, take his work, which is uh, to some extent, uh, to a large extent on Holocaust memory, but if we take his work and uh, use it also for the memory of industrial past, we can uh, come to stories of deindustrialization and memories of deindustrializations where we also meet many implicated subjects, where there are very few simple stories of heroes and villains, uh, but where, where there are a large amount of stories where we have overlapping uh, memories of uh, different agents uh, finding themselves on a gradient um, of um, um, processes of the industrialization. So um, if, um, if we ask ourselves then, or that's what I did in the, in the article, which memory regimes are reinforced by nostalgia under which types of deindustrialization. I would argue that uh, we have market radical forms uh, of uh, deindustrialization in the global north, but also in the post colonial south, uh, which leads overwhelmingly uh, to um, um, agonistic forms of memory where social movements are empowered through nostalgic forms of memory to work against the dominant silences or dominant narratives of the industrialization in those areas. And on the other hand, we have, uh, I would argue, corporate forms of the corporatist forms of the industrialization, very largely in the global north, uh, which lead to cosmopolitan forms of memory where nostalgia underlines the kind of cosmopolitanism, uh, the kind of uh, storylines that are victim centered in the sense of uh, that they are centered on the fate of workers uh, in those uh, industries. Um, and then I think uh, we have to look at the very many uh, variants that we find under those two broad regimes of nostalgic remembrance of the industrialization in order to find out where in particular those agonistic forms of memory that often side with um, those who are seeking forms of social justice and seeking to revive forms of solidarity that come out of those struggles against the industrializations to which Andy at the very beginning spoke uh, so, uh, so, so brilliantly, I think in terms of those factories largely employing women, uh, where they can support those kind of um, politics also in the present. And I think that's more than my eight minutes. So I've, I'll stop here. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefan. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, I'm gonna certainly come back I'm sure to to what you've just said in the questions and comments. So moving on, last two speakers. So um, I'd like to introduce Magdalena Navoa, who I will very quickly 
Ponce is an assistant professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and I'll put Russell Biog in the chat. So over to you Magdalena. Thank you very much, Hilary. Thank you, Hilary and Andy, for this invitation to uh, this round table. Very interesting and relevant topic for the work that I do. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, the role and uses of nostalgia. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm also going to talk mostly. Um, the role of nostalgia in heritage tourism uh, by Expo mining communities in Chile drawing from different theoretical approaches that actually resonate a lot with what Stefan just um, uh, talked about. So I will add to these um, different frameworks uh, the idea of gendered nostalgia that stresses the, the importance of intersectional approaches to analyze uh, affects and emotions in the industrial, the industrial -like context. Um, I'm, I'm not going to repeat basically what Stefan just explained at the beginning, how um, industrial heritage tourism has been often uh, framed as a conservative reaction uh, to the past and as a way of commodifying um, working class experiences. But following uh, my research uh, uh, and engagement with Expo mining communities in southern Chile, I will rather ground the analysis of nostalgia in industrial heritage tourism on these grassroots initiatives. And in my work, I also contrast them with official ones, but I will focus mostly on, on the grassroots initiatives. So uh, in this work, I have found that nostalgia is used by residents as an important driver in the a broader process of memory work that enables them to critically engage with the past and use it as a resource in the present to organize, engage politically, and envision an alternative future that is uh, based on their past. I also found that uh, the mobilization of nostalgia by different actors has important gender connotations and implications in the understanding and construction of the past, and, but also of the uh, post-industrial present, particularly because of the gender dynamics of um, ex-coal mining industrial um, dynamics and uh, the, the industrial experience. So to understand the works of nostalgia in these communities in Chile, I first uh, draw from a critical heritage scholarship that understands heritage, heritage as a sociocultural process to make meaning of the past in the present, uh, and that is linked also to the negotiation of various cultural and political identities. So heritage in the context of the industrialization is not solely about the industrial relics, but rather a political process of navigating change and dissonance that works to negotiate the historical narratives and values that speaks to the needs of the present. Uh, second, I also draw on the idea of memory work, specifically um, as defined uh, by Elizabeth Jelling, as a central process for negotiating whose conception of the past and what uses in the present prevail in these industrial heritage sites and how remembrance shapes current identity constructions. So some authors have uh, distinguished actually between uh, the, the notion of memory work and the concept of no nostalgia with the foreman being um, more progressive engagement with the past that has transformative potentials in the present and nostalgia um, being more an engagement that can only further past oppressions in the present. However, um, I argue that a, a less dichotomized view uh, should be considered and uh, we should also think about memory work and nostalgia as constitutive of one another. As Christina Hodge argues, it is not possible to look at the past as a source of change in the present without engaging in nostalgic longings. Uh, so therefore in context where individuals and groups have, have been socially and economically excluded uh, with process of, of industrial closure, uh, the interplay of memory work, nostalgia and heritage landscapes constitute a trigger for people to mobilize for political inclusion and identity recognition and also to bolster uh, self-esteem. Third, uh, I draw from Smith and Campbell's notion of progressive nostalgia, also mentioned by Stephen, 
uh, that argues that there are radical ways of using nostalgia that frame how the industrial past is remembered and reworked in the present by individuals and communities who worked and lived uh, in uh, industrial sites. So nostalgia uh, is then underlined by a desire to assert a sense of communal belonging and a sense of place in the context of rapid deindustrialization, social and spatial change, but also the transformation of gender roles. Progressive nostalgia in this sense also enables a comprehension of the structural and symbolic violence that accompanies the industrialization, including how heritageization processes are constructed and expressed. Critically engaging the past through memory work and progressive nostalgia helps to make repressed stories more tangible. And with this, I'm not referring only to the impacts of the industry and the effects of, of closure, but also about the role uh, of industry and extractivism in settler, uh, as settler colonialism. And um, this engagement enables people to make sense of past and present forms of violence and possibly triggering them to resist and challenge misidentification through heritage. Thus, memory work and nostalgia are key to both renegotiating identity and activated context contested past and to emphasize how heritage can either obscure or make visible a past and present marked by structural violence and enable mobilization for change. Finally, regarding nostalgia and heritage tourism, the analysis of gender uh, is fundamental and the literature often does not address women's experiences in industrial settings. And here, again, I'm not only referring only to women uh, workers, but those who were not necessarily part of formal industrial working force, but were crucial in sustaining life outside and beyond the industry. So from a feminist perspective, um, gender is socially constructed, intersectional and performative, which means that gender does not remain over time constant and is always entangled with other identities such as race, class, ethnicity and sexuality, which actually has been crucial um, um, in the work that I'm doing with these communities. So when analyzing the industrial heritage tourism efforts, the grassroots heritage tourism efforts in ex coal mining communities in Chile, I especially stress the importance of the multiple ways in which gender, class, ethnicity, and race were to, to constitute individual and collective experiences and nostalgic memories. So this gendered nostalgia is used in both official heritage tourism constructions and grassroots initiatives, and is embedded in political struggles to either uphold or append unequal power relations. So if feminist scholars emphasize the socially constructed nature of identity and, and memory scholarship stresses the relationship between remembrance and identity, then they must be considered in tandem to reach deeper understandings of nostalgia role in heritage tourism in the, the industrial context. Gender nostalgia emphasizes the sexual politics of memory and forgetting and the affects involved in such processes. So in this sense, nostalgic memory work can constitute a form of resistance to the erasure or stereotyping of past gender experiences and individuals and groups can mobilize it associated uh, representations for radical heritage tourism purposes. And with this, I refer to a type of heritage tourism that works outside in opposition or sometimes even alongside formal tourism practices and heritage narratives sanctioned by the state. So developing a sense of nostalgia around heritage that is framed by gender experiences empowers uh, these communities to retain a sense of pride in the past, which is a powerful tool I have found in the present for political, social, economic, and also cultural purposes. Mobilizing nostalgia through memory work allows affected women and men to recover uh, values and ideas that they can bring into the present as inspiration to challenge official heritage misidentification but also to propose cultural representations and urban citizenships different from those framed by uh, the industrial past or the post-industrial present. Finally, I have found uh, that gender nostalgia has enabled these communities to recreate forms and networks of solidarity in and beyond their local area, um, 
supporting and enlarging their grassroots tourism initiatives and making their experiences visible in a wider political and societal level. So I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you. And another person who's uh, brave enough to do these things about the PowerPoint. So that's a lesson to me and essentially to others. So moving on to the last speaker. So bringing it round back to where it began with Ewan Gibbs. So I'm delighted to introduce Ewan to you. And Ewan is a lecturer in economic and social history at the University of Glasgow. Over to you, Ewan. Uh, thanks, Hilary, and I'm glad that my daft comments on Twitter have resulted in some much more scholarly thoughts from, from colleagues today. Um, I won't go through the discussion that we've we've already heard about theoretical backgrounds to nostalgia, but I, I think it, it is important to say that I think especially in a UK context and the debate that's unfolded in the aftermath of Brexit and the perception of generational political differences, Nostalgia in the British context in particular, I think, is presented as syrupy and reactionary, um, and especially as painting over features of oppression, danger, or bigotry. And I think the current discussion about memories of the 20th century and imperialism and decolonization is important to that. But it's also visible in debates within what we might broadly classify as progressive politics. For instance, the Scottish National Party uh, distributed a leaflet a few years ago that said, don't vote Labour for your fallows, vote SNP for your children, which I think was quite an interesting message about leaving the past and moving on to the future. Uh, implicitly and explicitly in some ways, that was about in changes to the economy and industry and class society as well. Um, so why does nostalgia matter and how, how is it useful to us, if we if we accept that there's problems with this framing and we build on Bonnet's observations around critical nostalgia, I think what Stefan said was, was helpful, and I think it's important to think about critical nostalgia as a way to actually bridge the divide between past and present. And it's about how working class respondents in, in oral history interviews in this context use memory work to bridge that divide to make criticisms of the, the present and the future from the standpoint of the past to construct a, a usable past from which to build a future. But I think also to make criticisms of the, the past from the standpoint of the present in my interviews, this isn't a story necessarily of painting over oppression, danger or bigotry. It's actually a story of using the benefit and hindsight of societal changes to understand what was limited about the past. Um, I'm going to do this through two memories. One, one of coal mining in Scotland's central belt from the Ovens, and one related to the manufacturing of oil rigs in northern Scotland. These both relate to the 1970s and 1980s, and they both relate to the lives of industrial settlements more than labour processes or employment directly in the sense that they're from respondents who were born in the mid 1960s and only only one of them worked in the industry and only for a very limited period of time. So their memories of growing up in industrial settings. So the first of these, I think, is a, a very straightforward account of critical nostalgia. Um, it was an interview I recorded with Brendan Muhan, who comes from Musselburgh in East Lothian, whose father and grandfather were both miners in the Lothian coal fields in the post-Second World War period and Brendan himself became a miner in Moncton Hall Colliery following his father's footsteps when he was age 17 in 1982 and he told this story about how he how his feelings about the associational life the highly rules-based associational life of coal field settlements had changed as as he got older and he'd changed his perception from being a joint smoking 17, 16, 17 year old wearing his clash t-shirt and being told off by uh, older men who wore suits and enforced the strict rules of minors clubs that extended beyond the parameters of the club itself into policing community behaviour 
So from a position of relative hostility and a sense that this was an order that had to be overcome to one that saw quite a lot of value in that form of organisation, he argued that actually the miners' club and the annual routines of mining communities, including annual gala day parades, had been involving and mobilising when I interviewed them in 2015. He wasn't, no uncritical of what that involved. He referred, still in negative terms, to the hierarchies of mining communities, and he was very aware of how gendered that was. He referred to the fact, for instance, that a gala queen was selected from the the girls of, of the community uh, each year, and he saw this as problematic and, and, and promoting a highly gendered understanding that extended from mining employment. But nevertheless, he also argued this was something that was accessible for working class people being bold enough to celebrate who they are and in their own community. And he juxtaposed that with what he perceived to be a far more spectator form of sociability that's grown up since. And I think this is notable and important partly because it affects Brendan's contemporary practice. Brendan became a youth worker after he was arrested, sacked and lost his job during the 1984 strike. And he works in former coalfield areas, I think trying to take forward what he sees as some of the positive aspects of communal life without being uncritical or unreflected on the clearly negative aspects that he perceived these communities as having. So I think that was a more communal orientated memory. I'm going to move on to a personal memory, a highly personal one, that I think is also an important instance of a form of critical nostalgia. And I think when you come to the end of this story, you'll be surprised maybe why I chose to include this in a description of nostalgia. Um, this is from an interview I recorded earlier this year. So the man you see pictured here is Willie Sangster, who was born in Tain in Northern Scotland in 1935. I interviewed Willie's daughter, Liz, who was also born in, in the Highlands in 1965. Her father had worked in various jobs. He trained as a car mechanic, he'd been a milkman, and he'd also driven lorries for a living. But his family and his life changed forever when North Sea Oil came to the Cromarty Firth when the construction of oil rigs began in the early 1970s. Willie found a job as a welder and fabricator at the yard in 1972 and remained continuously employed there until 1984. And Liz remembered this as a major change in our family's life and in the life of the community in terms that I think are quite recognisably nostalgic. So she described this as a boom time. She described this as leading to very real material changes in her life. So Tain became visibly busier and it was the material impact of, of this economic activity that she remembered most, that she had toys, clothes and more food than she'd been used to before this change to, to the industry, the industrial environment. She also had some fond memories of the working life of the yard that she remembered being regaled with through her father, in particular during the construction of Highland 2. Highland 1 and 2 were amongst the biggest human-made moving objects in the world at the time when they were being built at NIG for, uh, the, for use by BP in the 40s field. And she remembered her father had uh, actually climbed up the top of Highland 2 and placed a Christmas tree at the top of it in December 1974. But these recollections that Liz had of the yard were tempered by what happened subsequently, just not long after Highland 2 was being built in, in the mid-1970s. She underlined that the camaraderie that her father enjoyed was heavily fueled by alcoholism. Um, she had underlined as well that this wasn't a recent development, that her father had been an alcoholic as long as she'd known him, but actually the provision of large numbers of workmates and also very high wages comparatively being earned at NIG made it easier for him to take this to a greater excess 
and he had more means to buy alcohol. She described him taking a bottle of whiskey into work every day, which he required to hold his hands steady to weld and fabricate. And that led to the separation of her parents' marriage in 1975 and Liz leaving Tane behind. But she looked after her father after the big payoff in 1984. So in 1984, the tension leg uh, oil rig contract was completed, which led to the end of continuous employment for most of the workforce at NIG. And Willie was paid off. Um, this was described by Liz as catastrophic. Um, it accelerated his alcoholism. He received a huge amount of money. He bought a new sofa and he spent the rest of it on drink. And Liz described her father visibly aging by decades in front of him in a very short period of time. He stopped eating, his hair turned grey, and he was dead by the end of 1984. Um, as you can probably imagine, this was an exceedingly difficult oral history interview. It was the hardest interview I think that I've ever recorded. But I think we see some really important and interesting critical reflections here as well. Um, firstly, there's the reason that Liz chose to do this interview. She's part of a Facebook group that commemorates the yard at MIG um, that is largely populated by former workers and their children. And she got in touch with me when I appealed for participants because she wanted to tell the story and she felt it was important. And she felt that connection with the yard established, re-establishes a connection with the past that's important for her. Um, this is partly because the history of the yard is now being written. So uh, BBC Scotland Channel televised a documentary about the yard recently. And Liz mentioned in the interview that this had rekindled her interest in it and that she felt emotional watching these stories and knowing that she had a connection to it, but sad that her father wasn't directly part of it. Um, she then went on to say that despite all the painful memories that she had associated with the yard and its impact on her family life, she also felt proud that her father had been involved in the construction of these large technologically advanced oil platforms. And she understood that they became integral to sustaining Britain's economy in the late 20th century. So I think there's has to be value to understanding critical nostalgia in expansive terms and considering this as a form of memory work. Industrial working class memories within a deindustrialized context involve making sense of a myriad of forms of loss at both a collective, personal and familial level. And I think as these recollections demonstrate, these mediations on the past are not necessarily prettifying and certainly not obscuring of negative experiences, but that instead both the highly personal and familial experience on the one hand and larger narratives of communal change on the other exhibit forms of criticality which relate both to losses in the present and the sense of injustices and, and problems with, with the current organisation of the economy and society, but also from a contemporaneous standpoint, allow for criticisms of the way the social and economic change was organised and contested in the past. Thank you. Excellent, Ewan. Ewan, thank you um, very much. I am going to take over now and chair the Q&A uh, session, but I just want to um, begin by thanking Fred, Jackie, Sinead, Stefan, Magdalena, Ewan and Hilary for a really interesting and engaging couple of those discussion. I think there was there's a lot that came out of that, a lot that I, I hadn't necessarily thought of before. Um, I really enjoyed that link. That I think we're all kind of trying to make between the deindustrial past and how that contributes to collective organisation in the present. I thought Fred and Stefan in particular really kind of emphasised that significance. Uh, but also in Magdalena's work through, you know, how does this play out in, in the heritage set? There's, there's so much we could um, we could go on and, dis and discuss, and hopefully this will be fruitful for future conversations as well. But we have got just around 20, 25 minutes for questions for the panel or for individual speakers. So I think the easiest way for me to do that is to just throw it open to questions. I'd ask if you can, please 
raise your hand using the function just because it's a little easier to um, keep on top of anything. If you don't if you don't feel comfortable speaking, you can also put your question in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that as well. So the first question, we have a hand up, which is always good. It's always the fear of the chair in case you don't actually get any questions, but I didn't think that would be the case. Uh, William. Hi, uh, I really enjoyed the presentations uh, about nostalgia. Um, one of my questions was, deindustrialization often leads to a lot of outmigration from an area that where this process happens. What what do you think this is for everyone on the panel? Uh, what do you think outmigration might uh, and nostalgia how how they might interact, how they connect? Because I, I guess in my personal experience, this sort of nostalgia is connected to leaving. <laughs> I will throw that across to the panel. Anyone, just feel free to unmute your microphone and, and come in. Really interesting, interesting question about migration. Does anyone deal with that directly? Or uh, yeah, I mean a little bit in the context of my 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 work on Nova Scotia, um, and I, I appreciate the question, William. For context, Will, William's from Port Hood uh, in uh, in Nova Scotia, which is in in, in Cape Breton, and. Um, has has been living in Alberta for many years, so under, understands that that context of uh, of nostalgia um, and out migration, and and in the context that I'm familiar with, I I would say that um, nostalgia um, is one of the primary ways that that people who have left behind their home for work uh, or um, who are the children of those who have done so uh, relate to kind of you know the home place or the or the 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 the, the village or the the town or the society you know that that they've thought about. Um, but again, to me, this is a sign. Uh, this is a, this is actually a, a sign of defeat um, and uh, and the absence of, of structuring liberatory politics um, because of course you know for those. Those who are familiar with the Canadian context, the the, the people from the east coast of Canada, uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, uh, Newfoundland, um, have in the last uh, 40, 50 years, ended up in, uh, massively migrating uh, to the west, to the to the tar sands, um, and this has been uh, in conjunction with the, the sort of planned um, underdevelopment of the eastern provinces, um, without any kind of effective challenge from an anti-capitalist left, either in the context of the west or the east. Um, and so this kind of leaves uh, atomized and 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 disjuncted communities to 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 come up with their own basically their own kind of memory work and strategies for for understanding the the their their dispersal and defeat right and this often is in the in the register of loss um which uh you know as i sort of outlined at the beginning is uh is something that um has a potential to be developed into into a critical understanding, but with without sort of collective intentional intervention in that sense um, is often left as as a kind of a a bit of a a, a background of of sort of cultural festering, you know. Um, hey, Stefan. Yeah, thanks very much, William. A really interesting question. I think we we would, I mean, it would be great to have more research work on uh, out migration and nostalgia. Sort of, uh, what do actually people who do migrate after uh, experiencing deindustrialization? Uh, how do they make use of nostalgia? Um, I, I mean, for a start, I think uh, there is no reason why nostalgia amongst those who stay behind should be any less intense uh, than amongst those who leave. Um, and those who leave, I think uh, it often depends on uh, where they leave to. Uh, so, you know, how are they received in the places where they are moving to and what are they doing in those places? Um, it will often be a comparison between the two places and um, um, nostalgia for something they are missing might be a great incentive to 
put something in place that might be reminiscent of those things that are missing in the new place. So it could lead to activism, um, but you know, not necessarily. I think uh, there are all sorts of options there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, as I started off saying, it would be a great research project to look at um, nostalgia amongst those who are migrating as a result of the industrialization processes. Okay, Joe. Thank you. Um, absolutely, Stefan, I was just about to touch upon um, that point um, of the individuals and communities that do remain, that in, in which some context, you know, migration doesn't happen. And I find that a lot with my research was that because of that kind of unique position of the community that I'm looking at, um, a lot of external factors prohibited that migration. Um, primarily um, sectarianism and things like that, that they were actually excluded from these new sites of, um, of work. So what you had was these communities engaging with a lot of community activism, really almost, and engaging with nostalgia, almost um, as a way of kind of creating this new imagined community that was very much based on kind of the communities that existed before um, deindustrialization kind of took hold. So I think in that sense that nostalgia can be quite useful for um, looking both ways, you know, looking at that out migration, but also looking at the people that remain. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for raising that point. Thank you very much, Ned. Um, no, as, as Stefan said, there's, there's a project to be done around this, certainly. Um, there's a, an undergraduate student of mine is looking at the, the diaspora of people from Liverpool, who sit in the, the west of England, and how, so just for a brief context, sit, Liverpool was um, kind of systematically run down under the, the Thatcher government in the 80s, and that kind of culminated in the, the football disaster at Hillsborough. And what she's interested in is how do people who have moved out of Liverpool still have framed their identity through that opposition to um to, to London essentially and yeah I will I will feed some of these questions into it and try and steer it more towards what Stefan was talking about because it's, it's it is a really fascinating um and chimes in with kind of historical diaspora and movement of people and um yeah it's not it's not something that I've 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 probably thought much about so thank you Bo. it's a really interesting point. Uh, if no one else in the panel wants to chime in on that there's a question in the chat from Stephen uh, Steve Hayes said, Fred and Jackie challenged the continued dominance or monopoly of nostalgia and how we think about the effective strategies of working class people. What are the alternatives to nostalgia and thinking about the ways people mobilise the past for the present? Uh, Jackie, do, do you want to come in, come in on that since you've been name, dri name dropped? <laughs> name dropped, okay. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, I guess, um, I suppose... <laughs> my thinking was partly that we've been I, just thinking about this um panel i started to wonder whether with this the con we've allowed the conversation to be too defined by this question of nostalgia in some sense um and and a lot of the work that's been done you know there's this whole sort of thread of, of work that a lot of us have been talking about today that's that's been trying to sort of in a sense reclaim nostalgia as something that can that can have a sort of political potential and this is more complex and uh, and all these sorts of ways but I mean the reason we're doing that work of sort of you know re reclaiming and reinterpreting is is because of this kind of uh, sort of dismissive um, uh, uh, discourse so we've in a sense allowed that to set the agenda um, in some ways I think you know so um, and you know, when I was looking back at the, um, I looked back at the introduction to Beyond the Ruins, where they make these statements about um, smoke smokestack nostalgia, and there's like zero evidence of what this phenomenon actually is. No one is cited as an example of smokestack nostalgia. There's this kind of, you know, injunction. The historians are sort of enjoined to kind of not do this. Um, but there's no example pointed to of where historians are actually or have actually done it or, you know, it's extremely, it's extremely vague. Um, 
And I, I feel like we've maybe gone as, as far as we can go with kind of showing that this is kind of, in a sense, um, not the case. I don't, I don't so much want to propose a kind of alternative concept to nostalgia, so much, I guess, as, as I'm sort of wondering, I mean, my own train of thought has been more about, I guess the question is not so much, you know, is this affect or this sense of loss or whatever it is, nostalgia, but rather, you know, what work does this emotion do in this context? You know, and, and let's not worry immediately about whether it's nostalgia or reflective nostalgia or critical nostalgia or some other kind of nostalgia, but let's let let's think about what, what work a certain sort of effective disposition or whatever we want to call it actually does in in a particular context. So I, I guess I guess that's as far as I've got in my in my sort of uh, thoughts on it. I don't know if Fred has anything to add. Um, a, a concept that I um, that has been very helpful to me, even though I think that I use it in a um, in the way that the author is maybe not intending it, but is that uh, Francois Hartog uh, talking about regimes of historicity. Um, and Lucy Morissette, who's also a co-investigator um, on our project, has kind of repositioned this, and she and she talks about regimes of authenticity um, in creating uh, relationships to the past. So the kind of relationships of uh, to 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 a collective, a bounded sense of uh, of a collective and its relationship to to the past, and you know how this gets projected onto various things that are heritageized. Um, and I think you know we can think about this in a in a in a more material sense as well that there are sort of formations or or social blocks, historic blocks uh, that have their own relationship to the past, um, and that there are sort of different levels with within an historic block. You know, one can be um, the maybe sort of more commercialized. Uh, um, sanitized heritage projects that maybe we've seen in some places uh, in, in the Ruhr, uh, or there can be sort of more contestatory visions within those, you know, but uh, uh, that they are oriented towards the past of the region in that way puts them in sort of in the same regime of historicity, you know, versus against, I guess, uh, against, I guess, a, a sort of a neoliberal uh, regime of historicity in which, you know, the past is dead and, and it's the end of history. Um, and yeah, so that that's been a helpful concept to me in thinking about uh, in thinking about ways that we can kind of move beyond the nostalgia uh, framework. Brilliant, thanks. And if I, if I can chime in just with my own thoughts, I think the, the the issue that we have is it also ties in with the those who are anti labour movement in terms of the the kind of common trope of unions being a thing of the past. And I think what we often fail to do as activists, and if we are activists, but also scholars, is to make those points that Stefan and Fred um, kind of said in their talks that there is a history, and it's it's not it's not it doesn't have to be nostalgia. It's a historic culture of solidarity that exists and that has existed, and it's putting forward that positive case about why that is as important in the present as it is in the past. So it's celebration, but it's using that celebration likes of what you discussed through, through the kind of mobilization points of the past but used um, in the present. So thank you, Stephen, for that. Uh, David has, uh, sorry, does anyone else in the panel want to come on to Stephen's question before I bring in David? Oh, yeah. Okay, David? Oh, yeah, Andy, can you hear me? Can hear you, mate. Yeah, all right, you're all right. <laughs> Good, man. Uh, I think uh, it's interesting debate this because, um, Looking on reflection now, I'm I'm 65, and sort of half my working life's been split up between the traditional industry in coal, which was on my dad's side, and then half in this uh, new brave new world. So that you know that near 50 years has been split split virtually half half. Um, I think Ewan and Stefan touched on these these issues about the um, the critical. Uh, looking at the critical memory bit of it, um, I mean, m many in many ways you can move this into positives and negatives. Uh, I mean, traditionally we've looked at you know the health issues in industrial areas and lower pay, the increased hours, unsociable hours, you know, the temporary contracts, and I can very much say 
you know, got the T-shirt, been there and, and can re and reflect on that. But as against that, I think you have to measure the positives, which are sometimes not mentioned, like, um, you know, for me personally, uh, gave me a second chance at education into academia. So you have to measure that against it. And then there's a the skills issue. Um, I mean, particularly in this world of IT. Uh, I made a, di a, dis uh, a distinct decision at, when I was 41 to leave coal industry. I could have remained in, in the few remaining pits what were in North Nottinghamshire, but it was about an issue you got to look at about gaining skills and wh whether you could adapt for that new world. What, what you realise were coming, whether, you know, and I, I will be first to admit, you know, some changes have been for the better, some perhaps for the worse. So it's been a, been a mixed picture. Um, but essentially, you know, if you if you measure against that health issue, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, would I, would my health have essentially been better if I'd have stopped in industry or getting out in it at 41? And the answer is probably the second one. Um, I do, I do think nostalgia does play an interesting role. Uh, and I see lots of old workmates as, as I go around the old goldfield areas in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Um, in, in that of workplace humour and having the crack, as they call it. So they all, you know, in, inevitably they'll all talk about that. And, and that does help people, you know, ironically, it keeps them alive. It might seem a, a, a daft statement that, but, you know, get, re reflecting on that, this nostalgia through humour uh, helps people deal with what they, they put up with through all that uh, changes. So, I mean, summing up, really, I do... I do see these issues in many ways as not 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 total loss. It's it's what we did at Trent three years ago at Nottingham Trent Uni. We did a an exhibition which you can find online on our mining heritage uh, website, and we distinctly called it Coal Community and Change because it is change. Uh, yes, some's for the better, like I say, and some for the worse. But uh, we've lived through a time of major changes, and that that's it's measuring up one against the other, really, the the positives and the negatives. Thanks very much, um, David. That's, that's really interesting to, um, to think about. The I Stephen <coughs> come back to the chat, and I think that's really interesting. Actually, the overuse of trauma and how perhaps, and I think Jackie touched on that, the overuse of nostalgia as a concept, and perhaps there's there's other ways that we can frame and, and think about these. Uh, you and you have not spoken yet. You've got your hand up. Come on in. I think what well, David's demonstrated is very interesting there, that actually former industrial workers are in some cases drawing up a balance sheet, which seems like the opposite of the sorts of nostalgia that we're, we're told are being engaged in. And I think that that does validate Jackie's point about who is, you know, nostalgia can be a stigmatising term to dismiss people's versions of the past. And it does raise the question of who's understood as nostalgic and who's understood as clear-sighted and forward-looking and, and you know I think we we can think about broadly how that tends to be distributed and understand across the political spectrum in class terms and then in our terms and that that seems to me to be very significant I, I agree with the point about trauma as well and I think there's a close relationship actually in some ways between nostalgia and trauma and and they're almost binaries aren't they that you have you know, the nostalgic past, which is which is in some way now covering up for the traumas that are being hidden uh, by that nostalgia. If you if you sort of you know that is that can become a very convenient way to to view the sorts of ec social economic changes we're talking about and how they've been remembered. That I, I think that idea about what what certain memories are actually doing and what this memory work is doing is important. I also think thinking about different levels of memory is important here, how people narrate their own lives, how this relates to collective memory or doesn't relate to collective work memory can be quite important. But also what David's just said, I think, reminds us that actually there's important discussions happening about the past in both academic oral history interviews and in public settings. I mean, the discussion about Hillsborough that Andy mentioned has been obviously hugely important in recent years. Um, in my own interviews, there were discussions about practices of socio-ethnic, religious sectarianism in Scottish workplaces, which are not written down in the archives. Um, and, you know, I was only able to include them because they came out in oral testimonies. So I think, what's that work doing? 
I don't think that's about trauma. I don't think that's about nostalgia in any simplistic sense, but it is about people actually drawing up a balance sheet and coming to terms with the end of the industrial era and in some ways drawing out what was very negative about that era and what actually the end of forms of industrial employment is meant in quite positive terms. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things that flow from that is how these residual structures of feeling remain in for in deindustrializing communities, and you know that's not nostalgia because I, mean, I did a project working with kids in a in a part of Scotland, and you know they weren't nostalgic for the past because they didn't know the past, but they just knew that they'd heard that things had been different, and there was another way that the community had been organised that was more collective rather than um, individualised. I think it also talks to kind of power, and that came up quite a lot in the the various conversations. Who controls the past, which is the kind of constant um, question. Oh, Magdalena talked about that in the. In the, in the heritage setting, and what it reminded me of is it's only working class people that tend to be nostalgic. The, the elites are um, support tradition, and we've seen that in the UK over the last month or so. And you and you pointed this out on Twitter with all the pomp and ceremony around um, the, the death of Queen Elizabeth. That wasn't nostalgic, that was traditional. So there's this tension, and Fred spoke to that it's who controls that narrative um, is the key, the key point. There are three minutes left, according to according to my clock. Does anyone have any last questions or reflections or thoughts before we let the Canadians get back to th their Thanksgiving day? No, I think we're all nostalgic out. Um, that's excellent. That just leaves me to thank everyone again. So thank you to all the speakers. Thanks to Hilary for co-organising this, for you and for sparking the initial discussion. Um, Gabrielle Gab for organising and, and doing that side of things from Depot. And yeah, have a have a great week, everyone. And hopefully this conversation is something that will that will keep going and we can keep kind of bouncing these ideas around because I think it was um a really interesting couple of hours. And thank you to everyone who came along and participating by asking questions and taking part in the chat.